Um, with all that being said, I invite your attention to first, the book of 1 John, chapter 3. It's 1 John, chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at the first three verses. First John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. There's a lot of stuff going on in the, the writing of First John. And First John, he, he's very blunt. He's very to the point of what he's, he's trying to convey and what he's trying to get his congregation to understand. Because a, a problem had kind of come up. These false teachers were, were coming into the church and they were, they were confusing their congregation. They were trying to take away the, the doctrine of grace and mercy and love and truth and, and salvation by Christ alone. They were taking that and putting it as works and grace mingled together. That, that grace was also true, but I, I, the way you lived your life and the, the things you did and the things you, you, you looked into and the thing, how you behaved all factored into your salvation. And so the, the congregation was confused. They, the, they, they were blinded, if you will, by this, this muddling of a works-based salvation mingled with grace as well. And they, they didn't know how to act. And so John, seeing the confusion of his congregation, seeing the anguish that they were in, comes in here in, verse, in chapter 3 and he tries to set them straight. He tries to get them to, to look on the, the solid truth of God. That being God's love. He gets them off of themselves and their works and the confusions that it's caused, and he puts them right back on track to see and focus on God's love. And I think that's what we need to do at times as well. I think we need to go back to the basics and look at God's love. And so that's what I want us to do here today. I, I want us to look at God's love. I want us to look in the way that John describes God's love, and I want us to look at how that love affects us. Now as we look in verse 1, I, I want us to pay attention to the word behold. He says, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Now the word behold here is very peculiar. It actually, it doesn't mean just to look at it. It doesn't mean to just glance at it. It actually means to fix your eyes upon a certain location, to hone in, to have tunnel vision directly on God's love, to, to see it clearly, to see everything about God's love clearly and focus solely on that. There was a man, he was golfing with a buddy of his, and they were on a golf course next to a highway. And the man was about to swing, and as soon as he was about to swing, he saw a funeral procession pass by on the highway. The man stopped mid-swing, got down on the ground, took his hat off, and knelt and said a prayer. His friend that was with him said, that's remarkable. I've never seen anybody do that. That's the, that's the most awesome thing I've ever seen anybody do, most respectful thing I've ever seen anyone do. The man looked at him and he said, well, I was married to her for 35 years. It's the least I could do. He just gave his wife a nod. He gave his wife a little glance. And that's what we do to God sometimes. We don't behold God. We just give God a, a nod, a glance of our eyes. We don't focus in on God alone. More importantly, we don't focus in on God's love. We just give it a nod. And we glance by it and we don't see it fully. We don't behold it. We don't cling to it. We don't have tunnel vision on God's love. Because what John describes next it's a very strange and peculiar love. Matter of fact, that's what he says. He says, behold, or look upon, gaze upon, 
focus on what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Now the phrase, what manner, is very, very strange in the original text as well. It actually means a foreign, alien, strange type of love. Something that me and you can't comprehend. Something that's so foreign to us as human beings that, that we can't put it into words. That's why John has to say what manner or strange and foreign and alienated love that God has bestowed upon us. So that's what John is wanting us to behold. This strange, peculiar love that the Father has bestowed upon us. What's this love? What is it? What, what is that John want us to focus on? Well, John wants us to focus on to behold the love that God had to send his son to die on the cross for your sins. He wants you to take a look at yourself and examine yourself and see yourself as God sees you as a sinner unworthy of God's love, completely unworthy, but God loved you just enough to bestow that love to you. That's the strange and peculiar and foreign love. It's where that God sees your unworthiness, sees that you're a bad person, sees your sin in your life and the things that sent Christ to the cross, and he sent Christ anyway to die for you so that you could behold this love, so that you could be reconciled by this love. Not only is this love peculiar and strange, it's also eternal. The phrase, what manner, gives the idea that God has bestowed this love in the past. It's be bestowed this love in the present, and God will continue to bestow this love in the future. It never goes away. He's continually bestowing this love. But there's a, there's a catch to it. He says that we should be called the sons of God. Not only do you get the love, not only do you get the love of the Father that he bestows to you in your unworthiness, but that you should be called the sons of God. So how do we behold this love? How do we see this love? How do you focus in on this love? The first step is to see that you're a sinner in need of the Savior. To see your unworthiness. To see that there's no help in your life other than Christ. To see that all the things that you try to make you happy, the money, the wealth, the friends, the family, your job, it doesn't help make you complete. What does is when you focus on the love of God that he would send his son to die for you and you put your faith and trust in Christ and cry out to him, say, Lord, I'm a sinner, save me. That is how you behold God's love. Where the love affects you in your heart and where you understand it mentally and say, I understand my sin, God, please save me. But something happens after salvation. Then he's given us the gospel. He's told us what to look at. He's told us what to behold. He's told us what to grasp. He's told us about the love of God. But then he says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. There's a change of attitude. There's a change of thinking once salvation occurs, once God comes into your life, once you're reconciled unto God, once you put your faith and trust in Christ to save you, a change comes. The world doesn't know you anymore. Your worldview, your way of thinking the way you once worked is no longer the same. Your thinking is focused in on God and God alone, not of yourself and how you used to live. It says here, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. They didn't understand him. And the world will not understand you and how this change has come about. Now, in verse 2, he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
So John has given us the, the, the gospel in verse 1. He's given us how Christ has died. He's given us the love of God. And now, in verse 2, he gives us the hope of salvation as well. The beloved, now are we the sons of God, already saved. Now we're adopted by God into his family. We're reconciled unto God, even so much to call us sons. But he says, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is every believer's hope. To see Christ, to glorify Christ, to see Christ completely. For you to be complete. For your anxieties and worries and stress and the chaos of this life to be completely swept away and bathed in the righteousness of Christ. To have a new body. Not a physical representation of Christ, but be complete or made whole. To where maybe some of you today struggle with life. Maybe life isn't as easy as you make it out to be. Maybe life isn't so simple. Maybe you deal with things you tell no one about. Maybe you struggle. Maybe you have fears. Maybe you have anxieties. Maybe you suffer and wallow in depression. But the hope of a Christian who has faith and trust in Christ is not in this world. It's in hope where we get to glorify Christ in heaven. Where there will be no more struggle, no more sadness, no more disease, no more depression, no more things that stress you out and worry you and complicate your life. Rather, your life is spent eternally glorifying the Savior in complete joy and honor of the sacrifice He paid for you. What do you hope in? Do you sit here today and you have no hope of the life beyond? Do you sit here today and you only live for tomorrow and the next day and the things of this world? Or rather, do you want to focus on Christ to where you have eternal hope and glory with Him? It says the world knew Him not. But now, once you become a son of God, you, you have this hope. And whether the darkness seems to creep in, even on our darkest days, we still can see that light at the end of the tunnel, and that's Christ pushing us onward in our hope and faith in him. Now, in verse 3, he says, And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now, in verse 1, he's, he's given us the gospel. In verse 2, he's given us the hope of the gospel, the hope of salvation after our lives have are, are done here on earth. And now in verse 3, he gives us practical advice for living our lives here on earth. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And a lot of people would take this verse to mean that you completely stop sinning. That you'll be a, a perfect creation. After salvation, you'll be completely perfect and pure that sin will not affect your life or it should not affect your life. Well, that's not what this verse is saying at all. What it is saying, though, is that after salvation, there is a standard that God commands you live your life by. Now, we may fall short of that standard, but it's not out of fear that we should do the standard that God commands. We should not live righteously out of fear that God will punish us if we commit sin after salvation. But rather, we should behold the love of God and out of that love that we have to God for saving our souls, live our life in honor of Him. It's like this. There was a woman who was, who was married to a man and, and he was a very... A very strange man. He liked to write things on note cards for his wife to do. He'd write like a list of 25 different things for his wife to do during the day. And if she didn't do all of these things, if she didn't meet his standard for the day, his quota, his little checklist, he would get very angry and he was displeased with her. And so this woman was married to this man for 10 years. And every day she went through this checklist. Every day trying to please her husband. She got sick of it. 
She was fed up because that was the only way to make him happy is to do this little checklist. Well, one day this man, he, he passed away. And a few years later, a couple years down the road, she met a man and she remarried. And one day, a couple of years after they'd been married, she went through some old things in her closet, old things in her drawer, and she found one of these little note cards, a little checklist from her previous husband. And she, she kind of smiled and she kind of laughed about it. Because she noticed that she was doing the things on the checklist for her new husband without even thinking about it. She was pleasing her husband. She was giving honor to her husband without thinking about it. And the reason is because her husband loved her. And her husband showed his love for her. And out of respect of the love that he had shown her, she then reciprocated that love. And this is what John is saying here, is that once you realize the unworthiness that you have upon you, and God looked past that and gave his son to die for you, to save your soul, once you see that, once you understand that love, your life will reciprocate that love to God. That your life will be an example for others to come to know God through love, not, not a fear. But once you understand or behold that manner, that strange, foreign, weird, crazy love that God has given you, once you put your faith and trust in Christ, once you've surrendered to Christ, once you've seen this love, once you've felt this love, it urges you to reciprocate it back to God. Because God deserves nothing less. He deserves our righteousness. He deserves us to be holy. Because what father would give his son's life for anyone in need? I wouldn't. I wouldn't give my son's life for anyone in here at all. But God loves you that much to send his son to die on the cross and for you to behold it, for you to grasp it, for you to put your faith and trust in it. To put your faith and trust in Christ so that you can have the hope of salvation, so you can have the hope of eternal life with God, and then after that, live your life for God. Out of love, not fear. Out of love for God. but it can only happen if you behold it. If you see God's love, if you look for God's love, if you tunnel vision in on God's love, if you've never seen that love, if you've never witnessed that love, I urge you to witness it today. To see that you're a sinner and that those sins crucified your Savior. But God's love for you is that if you reach to Christ, if you look for Christ and you repent of your sins and trust in Him, you can become a son of God. I urge you to do that today. To behold the love of the Father.